Okay, we're gonna revisit example 12. If you remember example 12 from before, we had a biased coin. It was gonna flip heads 60% of the time, tails 40% of the time. And we had this massive tree diagram. We were trying to calculate the probability that I got exactly two heads. And if you remember from before, before we did this, before we officially learned about binomials, we went through all of that rigmarole. Remember we were counting branches, figuring out, well, if I wanted two heads, I could go heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, tails, heads, all of those branches. We started calculating those, in, or those disjoint probabilities, right? And we found out they were all the same number because ultimately you would have two heads and two tails. It just depended on the order. And then we added up those disjoint branches. And then we even went further and we made the entire PDF table by counting all of the branches. Remember there was one branch for zero heads, one branch for four heads. There were four branches for each of the one and three heads being flipped. We had the worst case scenario where we were trying to figure out two heads being flipped and there were six branches for that. But there's all that work in there. And really what we could have been doing if we had known about binomial distributions is we could have skipped all of that and then used some properties of binomials to solve this. So as we go through this, let's see if this was a binomial distribution. And again, we're counting heads here. So if I move this almost all the way to the top, just so we have some room, and we really won't even need that much room, I could sit here and say, well, X, it's gonna be the number of heads flipped in four coin tosses. All right, and let's see if this works. So did I have a fixed number of observations? I did. We had four coin tosses. Okay, was there something I could deem a success? Sure was. We're counting flipping heads, so that's, that's my, my success, flipping a head. Are trials independent of one another? Yeah, what you flip on one coin has no a bearing on what you're gonna flip on the next coin. So these trials are independent. And what was the probability of, again, in quotes, success for this problem, we had a probability of flipping a heads 60% of the time. It wasn't an even 50-50, this wasn't a fair coin, it was biased. But the important thing is that I was able to check through all four of those properties. So instead of making that table, Right? Instead of making that giant PDF, I can use this symbol. And if you forget that, that's okay. But remind yourself, right? go back to this trait table. When you're on the binomials to make a PDF, you could write a table or just the symbol. The symbol is much faster. If you can recognize you're in a binomial distribution, things go faster. You don't need to make tables. You don't need to use tree diagrams. You just go to the symbol. All right, so we sit here and we say, well, I'm gonna flip four coins and the probability of success each time out is 0.6. And the probability we're looking for, it says, what's the probability of tossing exactly two heads? So I would like the probability, right? And the stuff in the parentheses is I want X to be exactly two, all right? Not less than or equal to, not less than, not greater than or equal to, not greater than. So I've got my probability, right parentheses, so I'm gonna put that equal sign and I'm gonna get numbers on this side. And in order to calculate those numbers, let's see what calculator function we're gonna use, right? I'm on the binomial column, how to calculate probabilities. So I'm either gonna use PDF or CDF. And you can see here, when you have the equal sign in your parentheses, you're gonna go binomial PDF. So let's crunch binomial PDF here. And then it's always N, P, and we call it your K value, or we'll just put the number two here. So out of the four trials, I want exactly two successes. I will move my calculator in and let's see what we got. I'll go binomial PDF, 4.62, and I'm looking at about 0.3456. All right, now that was the exact number that we got before. So if I turn back to our previous work, Right? We had probability of x equaling 2.3456. 
But instead of doing all this work, man, this was a lot faster. And if you ever wanted to make the PDF, you can use your calculator for it. So what I could do if I want, let me see what's in my list. I got a bunch of stuff, let me clear it out. I could put the values of my variable into L1, and then I could define L2 to be the binomial probabilities. So I could say, hey, can you get me the binomial probabilities? I have four coin tosses, 60% chance of success on any one trial, and I would like you to use all of the numbers in L1 and then auto-populate that into L2. When I hit enter, there's all of those numbers we got, 0 0.0256, 0 0.1536, 3456, and then 1296. And you can see them. They match up exactly with that table we had calculated before. But this is so much faster. So the big catch here is realizing you're in a binomial experiment, all right? So sometimes we just, we tend to forget. We think, all right, I gotta make a table. And usually you do, but there's that special case and it's pretty common. So if you can make, uh, and sorry, instead of making that table, if you can recognize you're in a binomial, then you don't have to make this table. You just write this symbol and you're gonna use binomial PDF or CDF depending on what the question states. All right, so we're gonna learn next about the mean and standard deviation for a binomial random variable. And then we got a couple of formulas and then we're almost done with this chapter. All right, I'll see you in a few, bye.